The first game in the best of three series between Tracking against Red Reaper for the Battle for Christmas tournament is all about to begin. The first game is gonna be played on the map Plains of Linden. This is the unrevealed tournament, so in this case, Red Reaper is not gonna see the faction of Tracky. And the first game is a Isengard Mirror, boys. Let's get it started. Um, Isengard Mirrors are matches we have not seen quite a lot on this channel. And obviously, this is the most balanced stuff you can actually get in Rise of the Witch King because the matchup is the same and it's being played on a neutral host. So no one has any advantage. If someone has an advantage in this game, it's definitely the Green Isengard player uh, Traki because he was picking random while Dread Reaper was picking Isengard. With that being said, Traki knows that he's against Isengard, but Dread Reaper doesn't know that. So he has a bit more knowledge that's gonna help him. Oh, that's you see that? You see that, guys? Dread Reaper was picking the Vision of Palantir and using it on top of the enemy fortress. That means in the early game, he won't have his buff war chance available for the fights. And that again is gonna give a huge advantage to Traki, who can easily start with the war chant or Kree Bane. But Vision of Palantir for scouting purposes might be necessary in some matchups. In this case, it's gonna be a great situation for the Green Isengard's player Traki. Beautiful. Two furnaces into the Uruk pit, into the third furnace. On the other side, we see two furnaces, three furnaces, four furnaces from the Red Isengard's player Dread Reaper, with the cousin from Me Shadow Fax. He's gonna build up a clan setting that's interesting. If a Uruk pit start. Uh, Gabi, thank you so much for the follow and welcome. Hope you're gonna enjoy your stay. Urukai start and Urukai um, are obviously much, much stronger than the Wildman of Dunland. But on the other side, they are also much more expensive. Remember, the Urukai from Isengard, they cost 400 each. And the Wildman of Dunland, they cost only 150 each. And because of the economical start of four furnaces, Red Reaper should be easily able to keep the clan dating, but also the Uruk pit up on the field and make multiple different types of units, which can be very useful in some situations like in this one, I would say. If you can sneak your Wildman of Dunland units close to the side of the opponent, you can actually deal quite a lot of damage, especially with the torches you can purchase on this Wildman of Dunland. Alright, um, he's gonna go for the Crossbowman. This is something I like to see a lot, because he has now for the melee units those Wildman of Dunland. And with the Crossbowman, he will have some sort of protection, so he can deal this amount of damage to the Urukai. Warchant advantage is on the other side, like definitely on the on the side from the Green Isengard's player Traki. Vision of Palantir is gonna be available soon, once again. And Vision of Palantir doesn't only reveal the shot, by the way, guys. It also gives movement speed to the allied units. So if you use it on your units, they're gonna move 15% faster. But obviously, it's not gonna be as useful as a war chant in those skirmishes. Alright, the furnace is gonna get demolished immediately. This way, you can deny experience and power points from your opponent. Crossbowmen are in position. Uh, war chant is gonna be used from Traki. And uh, with the shield ball formation, they're gonna be very, very tanky, guys. So they can easily, easily take down this furnace. That's gonna make them almost level 2. Almost. But they're not gonna hit level 2 after that. They can still, you know. Kill definitely some of these Wildman of Dunland. Smart move here using the uh, hold ground stance with the unit who is tanking and using the aggressive stance with the unit who is attacking and dealing damage. Able to Urukai, but they will be definitely taken down. But I would say it's still a great start into the game from Traki. He was able to destroy two furnaces and kill a bunch of units and keep the enemy units busy on the other side as well. Because during all this time, Traki himself is untouched, guys. Ricky, welcome. Long time no see. Easter, welcome. Hi, hi, guys. Thank you so much for being here. All right, so um, on the other side, Traki was also able to creep this work layer at the right side of the map. He is now moving to the troll layer, but this is gonna get interrupted by the Urukai from Dread Reaper. Urukai are much, much stronger than the uh, Pikeman in a 1v1 situation. They are also a counter unit to the Uruk Pikeman units. All right, five men are moving as well. In this situation, but Traki can... Oh, wait a second. That's a flank. I like to I like to see that. That's gonna be nice for Dread Reaper. He will be easily able to kill everything around right now. Look at that. The white men are dying though. Uh, in this situation, he should be using always the old ground stance. But that's absolutely fine. Uh, thank you so much for the follow, um, EA 
UOX. Welcome. Hope you're gonna enjoy your stay. The builder will get in safety. Just barely in the range of building a wall up. Beautiful. On the other side, another furnace is gonna be taken down. And look at that. Tracky also made the transition already into the clan setting for the Wildman of Dunland. Three power points collected by the Green Eisen Guards player. The game is lagging a little bit. I hope it's gonna be fine. On the other side, we have almost yeah, three power points collected now as well for the Red Eisen Guards player Dread Reaper. Who is sitting on 500 command points against the 450 command points from Traki. Traki is slightly ahead in terms of power points, but you know, I would say this game can still go either way. We're gonna have a second clan setting coming up for um, for Traki. At the same time, the Red Isengard player is creeping the last war clear um, on the map Lanes of Linden on the left side. So we have one clan setting, one Uruk pet. He might go later on for the Wildman Extrovers from the level 2. Remember, the upgrade is actually quite cost efficient, it only costs you 300. Um, but with the double clan setting, um, Traki will be definitely able to outspam his opponent. Looks like Lourdes is back on the menu, boys. Welcome, Lourdes. Warshine is gonna be available in the next 5 seconds for Traki. And 5 power points collected actually for the Isengard's player Dredge Reaper now. He can also go for the War Chant if he wants to. And obviously, in those big all out fights, the War Chant advantage is gonna be very effective. Being able to make your you know, units deal 50% more damage and being able to tank 50% more damage on the other side as well is huge in Rise of the Witch King. The buff is very impressive. So not having it on your units against buffed enemy units is gonna make those fights really one-sided. But we have now the Warchan available also from Dread Reaper. Traki can go for the Creebane now, which can, you know, again turn the fight in his favor, just damage-wise. That's gonna debuff the enemy units, they're gonna lose 25% damage and 25% armor. So Traki's units now are dealing more damage and receiving less damage. But the thing is that Red Reaper has just much more units on the field. And the crossbowmen are in the melee fight. They might be losing that fight still. But look at that. Look at the units in the backside. Those Wildmen with the torches were demolishing the Wildmen from Dread Reaper. And now he will be forced to retreat. That's a nice fight from Traki. I was, you know, kind of skeptical for a second because he didn't have any melee units around. He has only crossbowmen, but the Wildmen were coming in just in time and wiping out the entire front line from Dread Reaper. 575 command points available for Traki, 550 command points available for Dread Reaper. He has 3 power points now after Vision of Palantir and Warchant. He will still need around 2 power points now for the Kribeen. But the thing is, um, the good thing here for the Red Isengard player is that this is the only unit from Traki that is able to deal damage to the enemy buildings. Crossbow man, they will deal 0 damage. But the level 2 furnace is going to be taken down regardless, and whenever they deal damage to the enemy structures, they're going to steal money also. And if I take a look into the minimap, the map is looking green to me, guys. Um, Takte4, thank you so much for the follow and welcome, hope you're going to enjoy your stay. Okay, so 5 power points collected now from Traki. I think he will try to save for the 10, there is no need of going for the vision of Palantia in this case. He can go for the devastation easily, or for the Wildman of Dunland summon, he has many many different choices. 625 command points collected. On the other side, we have 475, so the gap is, you know, getting bigger and bigger. And losing the level 2 furnace in the front is not gonna help him out a lot. Yes, uh, Traki has now 3 furnaces level 2. And every single one of them is increasing the command points from Traki by 75. Okay, but, you know, the game isn't over yet. We have now Lords on the field, and Lords difference can be actually huge in the late game. Once he gets level 5, he will have leadership available. Which can begin, you know, which can get negated obviously from the Kribane, but keep in mind that Kribane is not gonna permanently be active, so it's gonna disappear after a couple of seconds, and you have you have a constant leadership as long as Lourdes is alive, and he's gonna get a lot of levels. Look at that. Once he's level two, that's gonna unlock the Carnage, so he can dive in, deal quite a lot of damage. I think Lourdes is overall a hero that can be useful in every single situation. I couldn't think about any situation in which Lourdes would be a wrong investment of resources. I think he is just very, very good in all stages of the game. 
Seven power points collected now by Traki. He's getting closer and closer for the potential devastation. 750 command points available. That's gonna drop down to 675 after losing this furnace. This furnace should be getting destroyed. Nice one here. Eight power points collected now. We have work packs now joining the battlefield from the work pits level 1. So these are the production buildings from Dread Reaper. He has one clan setting level 1, one Uruk pits level 1 and one work pits level 1. On the other side, Traki has double clan setting. Both of them are level 1. And one level 1 Uruk pit as well. No heroes just yet from Traki. Because he keeps spamming those Wipemen of Dunland and most of the time he also purchasing the torches. Which is a lot of money investment. Remember the upgrade cost you 200. There is a work sentry coming up now in the middle of the map from Traki. It's a great defensive structure against melee units for sure. And the fact that the army here from Dread Reaper is not including any pikemen uh, will make those works really strong. And I'm also quite surprised about the decision making of not going for the work riders as Traki because there are no counter units right now. He has only crossbowmen and a Wildman of Dunland. The fight is happening. Warchand and Kribin being used from Traki. 10 power points collected now. And look at that. He's, he's also using Warchand and Kribin on his units. So it's an even fight, uh, damage wise, stats wise. Lord is making a difference. He's level 3 now. And he's gonna go for the Wildman of Dunland summon. So he, I, you know, I think it's absolutely fine because he has a great amount of resource income with seven, uh, 675 command points available. But the Wildman of Dunland summon is not gonna achieve too much here, I would say. Might be able to win that fight, but I would say overall the Devastation is always a great choice because it's gonna give you a money boost which can be invested into something like Lords or Sharku. Talking about Lords, uh, yes, now the Lords already on the field. But he needs to be careful because the Lords from Dread Reaper is almost level 4. And with level 4 he's gonna unlock the Cripple ability that can be used on the enemy Lords, so he can't move away anymore. And if he's only level 1, he won't be even able to use the carnage. That means the lords from Dread Reaper can, you know, cripple him down, draw the sword and use the carnage and take him down. Easily. Alright, so the Wildman of Dunland got kinda defended very nicely from Dread Reaper. And this game is still open, guys. There is not too much difference right now in terms of resource income and command points. And for the next fight, Dread Reaper is gonna have his own Wildman of Dunland summon ready. I would say. The best way to use that is in combination with the Warchant and Kribin. So if there is a big fight happening, we can always use the Wildman of Dunland of yours on top of the enemy archers, which is possible by the way. And there are no counter units right now. Look at that, he's building up a work pit finally. Uh, the work pit is still level 1, he actually gets those work packs on the field, that's something I don't like to see that much. Uh, you know, especially in a situation like this, you want to have units that can trample down the enemy units. Batman of Dunland being already used. You also see some of these black orcs coming, by the way, from this in at the bottom right side, boys. Okay. Warchant is being used. It's a big Warchant, but actually not. He could have grouped with all of his units and use it on all, you know, all of them at the same time. I kill us six. Thank you so much for the follow and welcome. Hope you're gonna enjoy your stay. All right, the furnace in the front side is gonna be definitely taken down. And also Traki is going for the work packs instead of the work riders. I'm actually quite surprised about how the game is turning around. You know, like 5 minutes ago it was looking so great for Traki. Lord is level 4, where is the enemy Lord from Traki? I can't see him, maybe I'm blind, he is around this area. He needs to be careful like mentioned before, he's level 2 only, this Lord can cripple him down, which is now, you know, it's just happened. And I think there is no escape at this at this point. He can always draw the sword and use Carnage and go in the melee range and destroy him. Like, there is no chance of a level 2 or level 3 Lords with this much health handling this Lords with level 4 and full health. Ribbon is being used for the fight. He might be able to survive that actually, because there are no more archers and only this Lords is able to shoot. It's gonna be close. If he kills him... Oh, look at this! <laughs> oh no! Oh, he's gonna get away actually, that's crazy. Oh, if you chase him now, if you over chase him, you might lose a lot to the fortress. And nice one here from Traki being able to save Lords in the last possible second. Beautiful, well done. 
Lords from Dreadreaper is almost level 5, 10 power points collected now from the Red Isengards player. There were some torches upgraded, Wildman of Sunland. And look at this, the Red Isengards player is actually going for the Devastation and using it right there. He has 700 command points collected in total. On the other side, we have Traki sitting on 14 power points. Sorry, my bad. After the Wildman of Sunland, 15 power points, as we guys know, can be invested into something like Kraken, the Watcher. That can easily turn a fight in your favor. Because what we have seen in this game so far were grouped battles, right? So everyone was grouping a big army and then going for an attack. And the Watcher is so great against clumped units. The Watcher can wipe out everything, by the way, guys, easily from any of these players. And he has now enough power points collected. 15 power points available, almost 16, guys. Let's see. 725 command points collected for Traki. Dread Reaper went for 10 10. Look at this, he was collecting all 5 power points from the spellbook first. The vision of Palantir was his first choice just to be able to see the enemy faction. And on. Oh, he actually went for the Field of Fires. Uh, oh, yeah, that's true. Mr. Smog is just reminding me that the Watcher is not being possible to be picked because of the Lightman of Dunland. You will have to pick Devastation first, I'm assuming. So he was forced to go for the Field of Fires. Which is absolutely fine. That's gonna give him a lot of resource income. Uh, increasing the amount of resources you get from those Lamy Mills by 70%, guys. That's quite a lot. Double clan setting still. Uh, Work pits level 1, Uruk pits level 1. So he's spamming units all the time. On the other side, Red Reaper is gonna be a little bit behind in terms of power points just because he was picking another 10 power point ability. And he has Vision of Palantir on top of that. But he's ahead in terms of command points. He has 825 command points collected. The map is kinda splitted in two pieces. And this game is absolutely open, guys. Everything can happen. And I'm assuming in this kind of games, we're gonna see a late game, definitely. We're gonna see a summon dragon. We're gonna see a lot of fiesta, a lot of shenanigans. That's for sure. The builder has been taken down here, unfortunately, from a Dread Reaper. We might also see something like Sauron later on, hopefully. I would love to see that. Uh, Lourdes can be a great counter to Sauron, as we guys know. Lourdes is a great counter overall against any hero because of the cripple ability. Warchan is being used on these Black Orcs, and I like the Black Orcs quite a lot. They are very cost efficient in compared to Urukai. They are almost as strong as Urukai. And now this Lourdes is gonna be level 5. That's gonna unlock the leadership. That's gonna make the units from Dreadkeeper just much, much stronger as long as Kribane is not being active. Wildman of Dunland being used now from Traki. Lords is gonna hit level 5. You don't get experience, by the way, from killing summoned units. That's why you need to make sure to kill the normal units. That's something which is not being the case in Battle for Middle Earth 1. You can kill summoned units. It's gonna give you also command, um, I mean, experience and also power points. And for now, the Red Isengard's play is forced to retreat. And Traki is getting more and more power points collected. Oh, Lord's got crippled down. He has no more carnage, so he will need some reinforcements if he wants to survive that. He's level 5 now, that's unlocking the leadership. Warchan is being used now from Traki. You wanna make sure to kill this Lord's. The Lord's from him is very healthy. Yes, carnage available, which will be used now. Lord's is quite tanky and smart move here from the Red Isengard. Oh, but look at this. That's what I'm, what I'm, you know, where I said before. In this kind of situations, you can always use your sword as the enemy lords. After crippling down your enemy's lords, use Carnage and take him down. 12 power points collected, 850 command points with a bunch of lumber mills. He's building up now the armory, getting quite a lot of resources over time. On the other side, we have 725 command points available from Dread Reaper. He has barely any resources collected. He has to revive his lords. Now the favor is definitely on the side from Traki. He has a level 5 lords with the leadership being available. Wildman of Talent will be used on top of the enemy units. Now remember, uh, Carnage is on cooldown still, so he can't be using that. The furnace is gonna be taken down. The power points are rising. Beautiful. So he's being in a, in a small range. Dealing tons of damage. But I can't believe it, guys. There are no, there is no transition from both the players into the War Riders. I don't know why. Like, if you go for the War Riders, you can at least force your opponent to make multiple pikemen as a counter unit. Because he has one pikeman only. Look at this. 
So imagine if the Red Eisen Guts player would have some battalions of work riders. They are not only dealing much more damage and work packs, but they are also able to trample down the enemy units. And if you can't trample them down because he has some pikemen around, you can always go for harassment and try to take down the enemy furnaces. Charku is also on the field, level almost 3. Charku is a great hero also just like Lourdes in almost every single situation. And also he will be forcing his opponent to make multiple pikemen. Because we have seen this you know, quite a lot of times. If he gets into the backline of the archers, he is dealing splash damage that can wipe out the entire army in seconds. He's a one-man army in most of the situations actually. The game isn't over yet, I mean the Red Isengard player is still sitting on 700, 700 command points guys. And look his po power points, so he has 13 power points collected now. On the other side, he went for the industry, so Traki is going for full money. You wanna make sure to be able to purchase all the upgrades from the armory and for that he will need a lot of money, obviously. Industry is gonna give him a lot of money boost, just like Fuel the Fires. So economically, uh, we can agree that um, Traki is definitely ahead. Warchant is gonna be available soon from Traki also. But we have 15 power points collected now. Okay. The Vestation is available. He is gonna go for the Freezing Rain. Ooh, I like to see that actually. That's a, that's a smart move. Because look at that. Traki is so far away from being able to pick his own Freezing Rain, which will be needed. Freezing Rain is permanently debuffing the enemy units and completely negating the enemy leadership. So Lourdes' leadership from Traki is gonna be completely meaningless during this time. Lourdes got crippled down, both Lourdes got crippled down actually. There is a Sharku, around, no this is Sharku who got crippled down, my bad. I think this Lourdes from Traki is gonna be taken down. If this Lourdes gets level 8, that's gonna be nice because look at this what, hap what happens in the last couple of minutes. They keep killing stuff from each other all the time. Ooh, Sharku is diving in guys. Oh, look at this. There is a clumped army from Traki. If Shark gets in there, he can actually be so strong. And yeah, Freezing Rain is just coming in clutch. Debuffing the enemy units permanently. Look at this. He lose damage. 25, 25, just like from Kribane. And the only way to counter that is by picking your own Freezing Rain. And he is still quite a lot of time I mean, away from that. And if he goes for the Freezing Rain himself, that's gonna delay his 25. So in you know all situations pretty much, I think um, Dread Reaper is gonna be ahead. Because his Freezing Rain is loading again. That means by the time Traki gets his own Freezing Rain, if he's gonna go for it, his, you know, the Freezing Rain from Dread Reaper is gonna be almost back up. But I like the way that Traki is using the map in his, in his favor and actually, you know, making a great use of the possible pathways, pressuring his opponent from multiple sides. Fighting for the map control 24-7. We are getting a siege works up on the field, but keep in mind that the upgraded units from Isengard are very strong, guys. Yes, you know, Forge Blades purchased already. That's gonna make the units. Ooh, imagine Sharku in there. <laughs> or Watcher. Oh, I would love to see that. Where is where is Sharku, by the way, guys? I see Lords. Lords is here. We have some Warc Riders now finally coming from the Work Pits level 2. There is there are some pikemen around now, three battalions actually. And we are also getting some work sentries for protection in the middle of the map. We have level 2, level... Two. He's going for the level 3 now. That's gonna, you know, get those units out by uh, from these clan settings by 25%. Faster. Armory is level 2. He was only able to purchase the Forge Blades for now. Fire Arrow Upgrade and Banner Carry Upgrade are still to be purchased. And the army from Traki is looking scary to me. 15 power points collected now by Traki after the after the field of fires. I think he's gonna risk the biscuit and go for the 25, which makes a lot of sense. Because he's so close to that, right? 8 power points collected from Dread Reaper on the other side after the freezing rain. And also for the next fight, Traki is gonna have his Viper of Dunland ability available. And look at the army. If he can use Viper of Dunland with this army combined, and then go for a big war chance play. I think he doesn't even need the dragon from the 25 of the spellbook. He can easily win that fight with this army. Oh, Sharku? Sharku? Oh, Sharku! Sh oh, but there are too many pikemen in the front and he will be bursted down. The idea was nice because the army was so clumped and Sharku could be dealing quite a lot of damage. Pikemen of Tunland on top of the enemy units, guys. 
but they get trampled down the second they get summoned. That's a nice counter here from the Red Isengard's player Dredge Reaper. But look at that, what Trucky is doing during all this time. He's splitting his army, making sure to pressure the other side, trying to get something else from the map. As he's, you know, grouping up with his main army in the middle. Winning that fight, pushing his opponent back, and the Waldman Extrovers with the Forge Blades are hitting like an absolute truck. Lurtz is back in the business, level 6.5. But Sharku is down. We have a Ballista, and I think Ballista, you know, the Ballista is the weakest siege weapon in the game against the units. Like, even ants are better, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, just think about how a trebuchet with Firestone upgrade would work in this kind of, in this kind of situations. The Lords is also on the field, he's gonna use the cripple now on the enemy Lords. Uh, Traki is pressuring from the other side with pikemen and forge plates. Dealing quite a lot of damage, and we, if we take a look into the current command points, we can see Traki is sitting on full. He has 25 power points collected, he will have 25 power points collected in the next couple of seconds. We have 675 command points available only for Dredge Reaper, and that's gonna become less and less because he keeps losing those furnaces left and right. And there we go, boys. That's the best ability in the game when you, when you want to destroy the enemy buildings, and you will see what I mean now. Every attack of this dragon is like the breath fire ability from Balrog. He's dealing quite a lot of I mean, area of effect damage. Look at this. Four structures down just like that. Just like that. And now he's gonna lose to Uruk Pet because it's only level 1. That's the last remaining production building he has on the field. And he's not on... Look at this damage, guys. He was able to hit the fortress and GG's gonna be cold. What a nice game, guys, in the game number 1. But the series isn't over yet, because this is best of 3, we're gonna jump right into the game number 2, boys. The game number 2 is gonna be again Isengard against Random. Uh, Traki was picking Random also in the game number 1, and end up getting the Isengard faction, was able to win that game. And now we're gonna get to see the second game, boys. No, no, of course not, but in Drew. <laughs> Alright, now it's gonna be a classical matchup, I like to see that quite a lot, Isengard against Men of the West. Good against evil guys. Um, let's see what's gonna happen. I mean, Dread Reaper has to win this game if he wants to reach the game number three. If Traki ends up winning this match, he will be moving to the quarterfinals in the winner bracket. We have the green man of the West player Traki, who was having a fantastic performance in the game number one with the Isengard in the Isengard Mirror match. And his opponent at the bottom side is the red Isengard player Dread Reaper, who is again gonna start with the vision of Palantir just to be able to scout his opponent. And I think he's gonna wait with that, which makes sense. This way you can actually not only see the enemy faction, but you can also see his production building. He's able now to see the barracks from Traki, which is building up after two farms. But again, Traki will have his buff advantage, so rallying coal is gonna be available from Traki. And this is what you get from the random unrevealed in this game. Because normally in Rise of the Witch King, if your opponent is picking random, you are still able to see his faction in the loading screen, but not in this tournament. And that's why I like to see those, you know, scouting abilities like Vision of Palantir. Because you lose quite a lot from picking that. You have no more buff available now for the early game. Let's see. Melkor, welcome. Two furnaces, three furnaces into the Uruk Pet. Into the fourth furnace from Dread Reaper. The Isengard player. And we have an early barracks, kinda early barracks after two farms. So he will have the pikemen coming first, way faster than the Urukai or anything else from the Uruk pit. And with that being said, he can go easily for the creep, and that's the waypoint already. So the uh, Rohan Spearman units are gonna move to the work layer instantly. Which is nice, they're gonna get level 2 after that, and you know, getting some extra money from the creep is always nice in the early game. Uh, and that's kind of the 101 strategy in Rise of the Witch King. You make pikemen, creep with them, get them level 2, get something, you know, from the creep. And then group with them later on with the soldiers, so you have swords and pikes combined. Then you can go for the attack with the rallying call, which can't be countered from the Isengard player with a counter buff, because he was forced to pick uh, the vision of Palantir. But he will have some crossbowmen luckily around for some sort of protection. But I think he will need, you know, more than one only from them. So let's see. Uh, should be giving the last to the peasants. There we go. Nice one. Level 2 secured. The treasure secured. 
Now he's gonna move through the through this tiny pathway at the right side. But he's gonna run kinda right into the archers here. I think Dread Reaper is expecting his opponent to attack from this angle. Beautiful. So he might go for the creep here as well if he wants to. Let's see when the Isengard player is gonna be able to see him. There we go. Now he's able to see. That's really nice for Isengard because that's gonna increase his reaction time. And he's gonna be able to deal some free damage. Look at this. You know, damaging him, forcing him away from the creep is always nice. We are getting some more soldiers now from the barracks and he already made the transition into the archer range. Beautiful. Building up more farms. 400 command points, it's gonna be 450 after this farm is gonna come up. This creep can now be easily secured by the Isengard player, which is really nice. During all this time, Traki is making sure to capture this signal fire in the middle of the map. Uh, 7th Twisted Destiny 7, thank you so much for the follow and welcome. Hope you're gonna enjoy your stay, buddy. Okay, beautiful. Creep being secured now. Double Uruk pets, by the way, for the Isengard player, so he's gonna spam. Urukai, Spearman and the Archus at the same time. And Traki is going for a big push. He will have for the attack two, uh, two battalions, three battalions of soldiers, one pikeman and one archer. Uh, and the archer range now is level 2. That means we will definitely get to see some of these rangers. Creeping in the middle. I think he's gonna just wait for the rangers to approach. Because if he will have those rangers inside the army for the big push, the attack is gonna be way more successful because we know those you know rangers are hitting like an absolute track guys especially against tier one units like they are much much stronger uh, than the gonda archers right there okay uh, so two creeps secured by the man of the west player tracky one secured by the isengard player dread reaper uh, rallying call is being used now remember warchand is not ready he has vision of palantir and he's far away from being anywhere close to collect the power points he needs. Crossbowmen are doing, uh, doing a great job. He needs some sort of protection with the pikes in the front with the porcupine formation. That's nice. Nice situation here actually for uh, Dread Reaper. But the thing is that these units are just buffed. That's a huge difference. Trust me on that one. If Isengard would have, you know, buff available for this fight, it would be way, way easier to defend such an attack. Warchan is, you know, making your units deal 50% more damage and making them 50% tankier. That's quite a lot of stats you lose by picking anything else but Warchan in the beginning of the game. Uh, 600 command points available though for the Isengard player. That's gonna drop down now to 550. This furnace is gonna be definitely taken down. Nice move here from Traki splitting his units. You wanna deal as much economical damage as he possibly can. This furnace is gonna get destroyed for sure. Nice clamping here, making sure that every pikeman, or maybe not, maybe he can save the day with the crossbowman arriving just in time. That's gonna be close. But he will be definitely able to deal quite a lot of damage and can finish off this furnace later on. For now, Man of the West player is forced to disengage. But that's fine. The Urukai, they won't be able to finish off this farm in the backside. For the next fight, the Man of the West player is also gonna have a lot of rangers on the field. Which is gonna make his army much, much stronger. 550 command points available now for the Isengard player. And 550 command points available also for the Man of the West player. But he has, you know, way more units on the field right now than his opponent. And he has also tier 2 archers, unlike his opponent, the Isengard player. The Rangers are dealing quite a lot of damage. In this situation, if you know you're gonna die anyway, you can always go for a sneaky long shot and hope for the best. <laughs> So you might be able to land a random long shot on the archers and one shot them. Lourdes is on the field now. Which is nice in this situation because remember Man of the West player doesn't have any way of negating the leadership. So Lourdes, once you get him level 5, you will have always leadership. And that's the power of Isengard. Because what can potentially happen later on is you have a Lourdes, which means you have a permanent leadership once he's level 5. That's the one thing. You have Warchant, which is something like Rallying Call, so it's 50-50. But on top of that, you have also Kribin. So you will have leadership and buffed units against buffed but debuffed units from the enemy. And just because of this abilities, Isengard can out damage the Man of the West uh, faction's army easily. Hopefully, we're gonna see some units later on. Boromir could be a nice choice. Uh, you know, Wombo combo potential with the Rangers. 
Isengard will have no fear resistance until Saruman is gonna arrive on the field, keep that in mind. And Saruman has to get level 5 first for the fear resistance to be active. So it's a long time investment until Isengard can, you know, can get anywhere close for a potential fear resist on his army. That's why I think Boromir can be a great choice overall in, you know, until the very late game. Lourdes is gonna get some more levels from killing those units. He has to disengage, don't take free damage here for no reason. Look at the damage he's receiving from these couple of units. Uh, hit and run in this kind of situations. The builder has to be careful, he's running for his life. Should be able to get away. And I think this attack is gonna be kinda okay to defense, but the rangers in the backside, they're gonna be very strong. And look at the crossbow and they are off position guys. They are not in the best position right now. Uh, rallying call. Oh, that's gonna be massive. Isengard player doesn't... He has Warchan. Okay, he has Warchan, which will be definitely used here. There we go, on this on this crossbow man, which makes sense. Lourdes has to be careful. Uh, what you can do with Lourdes is stay inside the army. The reason for that is there is a sharing experience kind of thing in Battle for Middle Earth games. So if you are being in, you know, as he is now, right now in the crossbow man, he's gonna get... A lot more experience also from killing the enemy units with this battalion of crossbowmen. So leveling him up is gonna be way way faster. Lone Tower being summoned by the way guys. He has rangers inside and Isengard has nothing that can destroy that Lone Tower right now. Actually in order to destroy this Lone Tower he will need some ballistas. Or quite a lot of Urukai and pikemen. Uh, and what you, can, what you can always do with the Man of the West faction is you can go for Revealed. Kind of try to beat your opponent into destroying your lone tower and in the last possible sec second you use your rebuild on the tower and that can kind of make your opponents rage quit the game. <laughs> Alright, 650 command points available for the Man of the West player. Sharko is joining the battlefield who might be a great counter unit to this uh, rangers. Barracks is level 1, double barracks, both are level 1 only. Lords, thank you so much for 6 months subbing, that's crazy man, thank you so much. Welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Just for six 650 command points available for the Man of the West player. And 650 command points available for the Isengard player. Might go for the Wildman of Dunland summon and try to commit on taking down this uh, Lone Tower here. Which is always a possibility. But I think the Wildman of Dunland summon is kind of kind of double-edged sword in this kind of situations. Why? Because it has an animation. So you use the White Man of Dunland, it needs it takes like 5 to 10 seconds for you to control them, right? And that might give enough time to Tracky to use long shot the second he sees your White Man of Dunland being summoned. And he has a high chance of landing this long, long shot on your White Man and one-shotting them the second they get spawned. So if this happens, it's very un unlucky for you, obviously, right? That's why in most of the situations. Especially against rangers, I would say going for the devastation might be a better choice. We are getting more and more rangers. He's building a tower right there to protect this farm in this pathway. Expanding quite nicely. Sharku is gonna be used for map control fights. He might be potentially able to take down this farm. This farm in the backside is very low, so I think he should be trying to take down this first. If your opponent if doesn't demolish your structures, killing a farm is gonna make him almost level 3. Now for you, that's that's really important to demolish the structures in time. Almost 9 power points collected. I can see Dread Reaper is going for, for Wildman of Dunland. I think he's gonna go for the Wildman of Dunland and use it right there. I can see it. But maybe I'm wrong, let's see what he's gonna... Oh, he's gonna go for the Devastation. Okay, I like this more. Devastation is being used. Nice dodge on the long shot from those Rangers. Very well done. 650 command points available. Look his money though. Is he going for Saruman or something? I don't. I can't tell you. He has around 3,000 resources collected. I think Saruman might be the choice of the Isengard player. Yeah, he's definitely gonna go for Saruman at this point. Saruman is on his way, boys. I don't know about that. Let's see. I mean, I'm excited. <laughs> we have Boromir on the field now. Boromir, once he's level 2, is gonna unlock the Horn of Gonzo. But again, Saruman can counter that easily once he's level 5. Uh, rebuild is available for the for the fights. I mean, also to protect this uh, tower here. Devastation money is being used into Saruman. We have already Lords on the field and Sharko on the field. Sharko is level three because he was able to kill the farm. These farms are very low as well. He's gonna commit now on the tower, which might be a mistake. 
Because there are no, not enough melee units right now, and this range are demolishing everything from the Eisen Guts player. Longshot is incoming, Longshot is incoming, but he's gonna be able to dodge just in time. Lurt is throwing the sword, he's level 4, he's diving in the enemy army. No, he's gonna use it on the tower. But remember, Rebuild is available from the Man of the West player Traki, and that can save the tower for multiple seconds. And I think he's gonna use it. There we go, just in time. Boromir is diving in, he's gonna hit level 2 very soon, that's gonna unlock the Horn of Gonzo. That's gonna stun the enemy units and they won't have any chance of getting away and that's a lot of investment and just being countered that easily from a simple powerpoint ability from the spellbook of men of the west the rebuild was able to save today and he has also fighter upgrade purchase on these archers it means they will now be increasing their dps against the enemy buildings incredibly high and they will be potentially able to destroy those furnaces in multiple seconds like that's gonna it's gonna burst down, burst down those buildings in a second once they use the Bombard ability with the Fighter Upgrade purchased Rangers. Saruman is on the field, level 1, he's not gonna be that useful, especially if Truck is paying attention. But if he... Oh, that's a nice Wizard Plus, by the way. He's almost level 2, that's gonna unlock the Fireball, and I think that's the time for Saruman to shine. That's gonna be a nice defense here. Fireball is available now, he might use it on, on uh, the Rangers, which makes sense. Lourdes is level almost 5. Again, leadership is gonna turn this game potentially around. And I think Lourdes um, and the army here from the men of the, uh, from Isengard, they should be able to take down uh, Boromir. Yeah, Boromir is gonna die because he is not going for the heal. Longshot is incoming, but he will be able to dodge. And Sharku was also able to survive. Lourdes is almost level 5. Uh, he's level 5 now. Okay, leadership is unlocked. 10 power points available for Traki. 775 command points. On the other side, we have 750 command points available for the Isengard player. He has 8.5 power points collected after the Devastation, Palantir and Warchant. He can go for the for the Kribin to make the enemy units weaker, but it's not gonna negate the leadership because there is no leadership right now on this side from the Man of the West player. He has also Grand Harvest purchase on the Marketplace, that's gonna increase the amount of resources from these farms by, by 15%, that's quite a lot. You know, considering the fact that he has so much command points collected, he has a lot of farms on the field. Uh, and that's what I mean, look at this now. Look at the damage boys from these long, -shotted, long shots uh, of these rangers with the fighter upgrade purchased. Fireball is coming in clutch! Beautiful fireball there! And that's the power of the wizards of Middle-earth. You gotta love them, guys. They can turn the game around that easily. And this guy, is this is not even his final form. Imagine him getting level 6. With the Thunderbolt, he has Thunderbolt, range ability, he has Fireball, range ability, and if this is not enough, you have Fear Resistant with level 5. That's gonna completely shut down Boromir, right? He has Wizard Plus if you get anywhere close to him. And if this guy gets ever level 10, the Dominate can gain the control of the targeted enemies permanently. Like, you can get this ranges to fight for you, <laughs> easily. And the game can still turn around in the Isengard's favor. Just because of this white wizard of Isengard, boys. Oh, beautiful! Oh my godness, this is the nightmare of Traki. This wizard plus, this Saruman is popping off, ladies and gentlemen. And he's just BMing, standing there in front of the enemy units and using the speechcraft to level up his own units. <laughs> That's what I love to see in this game. And I love the wizards and I would love to see Saruman and also Gandalf much more often in those games. And maybe Traki should be going for his own wizard, but he, I think he has a lot of money. He needs to go for something, right? I think he has something cooking in the fortress. I'm not sure, but I think he has to have something cooking in the fortress. Look at his command points. He has full command points with Grand Harvest on this uh, marketplace. So his resources, they should be very high. Let's see what he's gonna have coming from the fortress, guys. I mean, maybe not, because he's a level 3 bar uh, archer range, he's upgrading those ranges all the time with fighter upgrade that also costs 300 each. And he also goes for the tower guards now, which are much more expensive than those Rohan Spearman units. He has almost 15 power points collected after the lone tower, which by the way is available for the next fight. The farm is gonna be taken down, but we gotta keep an eye on Saruman, because he's very close for the level 5, fear resistant and very close for the level 6 power spike with the thunderbolt. 15 power points collected now by the man of the West player. What he's gonna go for? That's the question. Look at this. He's building walls. 
What am I watching right now? He has the uh, Rohan Allies summon ready, which can be used for a sneaky attack on the fortress. The fortress has zero protection, guys. If this guy can go around the fortress with his Rohan Allies, he can burst it down very fast. Let's see. I mean, he has Rohan Allies, he has Lone Tower, but on the other side, he has to now deal with some Ballistas. Devastation is being used. Ballistas are coming. Nice dodge here from the right uh, Isengas player. Very well done. Uh, Gundula Gold Krone, thank you so much for the follow. A nice fireball here on the Rohirrim from the Rohan Allies summon. Again, killing the summoned units from your opening are not gonna give you any kind of experience and or power points. Really important to keep in mind. If you are wondering why Saruman was getting zero experience from using this fireball. And that's gonna give him level 5 very soon. I mean, nice defense after all, but he had to invest 15 power points summon for that defense. You know, and almost all the Rohirrim are gone already. And during all this time, Isengard's now fighting for the map control, killing multiple farms. And look at that, he was sitting on full command points, now he's dropping down to 800. Boromir is level almost 3. He can use the, you know, Horn of Condor to save the day here, to save the level 2 farm, to stun the enemy units. He has to get somewhere closer, I think. The range got nerfed, if I'm not mistaken. He's gonna use it. Oh, but just one second too late. The farm has been taken down anyway. Look the money from the Man of the West player. He has still quite a lot of resource income, guys. We have also full command points from the Isengard's player. He was expanding very nicely. And I think Trucky has to do the things what he was doing in the previous game. He has to fight for the map control. Maybe getting some Gondor Knights from the stable. And using them for the map control fights is the way to go. Maybe get Theoden on the field, because Theoden gives leadership to the rangers with level 1. And if you ever get him level 6 with the glorious charge, you can, you know, combine that with the Rohan Elias summon. But Isengard has Kribane anyway for the next big fight. So let's see what's gonna happen. He has leadership available on Lords. Saruman is gonna be level 5 in this fight for sure. One of Gondor is on cooldown anyway. The tower has been bursted down. The power points are rising. Luckily, he was able to kill this Ballista with the... What was, what was killing the Ballista? I'm not sure. There's fire on the ground. Okay, Saruman is level 5 now. Fear Resistance is being active. Horn of Gondor is gonna get negated. Won't be able to scare or fear the enemy units anymore. Long shots are coming, but Isengard army is just looking very strong in those kind of situations, guys. Holy moly. And he has freezing rain just like in the previous game, debuffing the enemy units, making them much, much weaker. While the Isengard army is gonna remain strong. And debuffing the enemy units kind of making your units stronger because you now are able to deal 25% more damage to these units. Um, and on top of that, you have leadership, you have buff from the war chant, so you are really strong. Level 6 would be amazing to see. We have Aragorn on the fields. If anyone can save the day, it has to be Aragorn, the king of the men of the west. I'm just joking. He's getting bursted down, guys. What can you do against such a reckless hate? That's what Theoden likes to say in those kind of situations. And the answer might be nothing. He has Atelas available for a second heal. He has to use it now. But he won't be even having the chance to get level 2 before the Blade Master to be active. Aragorn is getting bursted down, the power of Isengard is just too, too much, and level 6 is unlocked. Keep an eye on this white bad boy for the Thunderbolt ability, Booyah! And Isengard is popping off with this wizard, and you can tell me whatever you want, guys. For me, the game turned around after Saruman was joining the battlefield. Let's be honest, Isengard player was Tanzo. He was almost goners, guys. You know, he had no chance anymore, and Saruman just in time, saving the day, Saving Isengard and bringing us right to the game number three because I don't see any more Traki coming back from this situation. Right 12 power points collected after Rohan allies. Three ballistas are wiping out those structures from a safe distance. The freezing rain is coming in clutch. And guess what? Even Cloudspray can't stun the enemy units because Saruman is around and he's higher le than level five. All right, so Horn of Kondo is on cooldown. Long shots are coming but not even dealing quite a lot of damage to these units because they have leadership from lords. Uh, yeah, look at this Ballistas. He's getting more and more Ballistas now. They are in a perfect lineup. 
they will be dealing a lot of damage. Agro Bio and Vince2206, uh, thank you guys so much for the follows and welcome. Alright, uh, Boromir got crippled down just like in the movie. Tom Bomber deal, you know, how you want to deal with a wizard, you need to also get a wizard on the field. Maybe that's the, that's the way you want to deal with them. He actually deals like zero damage to the, to the Ballistas. But he's a great counter to the heroes, by the way, guys. Why? Because he keeps knocking them on the ground all the time. Like, he's really, really good when you want to kill the enemy heroes. But you need to have some sort of backup, right? <laughs> Alright, so he's gonna be for... I mean, that's what we see all the time. If anyone summons Tom Bombadil instead of trying to kill him, if everyone decides to disengage, because trying to kill this guy is kind of a waste of time. He's very powerful. GG, well played from both the players, and that's what I'm expecting from a best of 3 series, guys. We're gonna jump right into the game number 3. The score is 1-1. Tiebreaker, which is gonna decide who's moving to the quarterfinals and who is dropping down to the loser's bracket.